by the winner of the Pride of Pride, the Pride of the Pride. And uh, it, I want to tell you, it's incredibly enjoyable to read all of the books. Uh, I have this huge bookcase, the good size of Book Pride, judging it is other than a whole shelf of books that, that you can refer to. Uh, but it's also very hard to make these decisions, and so I just wanted to preface that. And thank also my other members, um, both of whom could not be here today, Sandra uh, Lenny and Mary uh, Smart. And uh, I just want to briefly announce and give due credit to our fabulous uh, honorable mentions that were completely um, difficult to not mention. So let me just say, uh, just for all in alphabetical order, that is, uh, Donna Crowley, can you stand up please? And this is her book.
thank you to Susan and um, Cassandra and Marie Smart. And I also want to thank the MSA for awarding this um, to a biography, so, and also to Mary and Moore, so thank you very much.
the intellectual leadership, care, and generosity of spirit of one so far unthanked person, but to whom we are all indebted. People of the MSA, I give you Linda Kinahan. into the charming gay world of endless friendship among the dead. 
Nobisha Philip claims the griotic textual power of mourning the sodden history and destructive cost of rationalized modernity. Some of these poems express their socio-aesthetic citizenship by standing up for local acts of investigation, particularized resistance, and invention of ethics amid degradation. <laughs> Patterson is a contrast between disconnection, waste, and some new loose spirit of investigation and unchained desire. One of Jovis's characteristic documentary gestures is a protest letter speaking out to political powers about unjust imprisonment. Divine comedy, gravity, and the Sahara Testaments are eco-historical cartographic inventories of what is here. Certain poems are elegiac pilgrimages, pulsing forward, toward an ever elusive goal, but a sense of, sense of permanent, possibly quasi-messianic pilgrimage. Um, pilgrimage. Sorry, I'm really kind of confused here. Yeah. Um, Mackey's long poem is like this, and drafts as well. A lot of these works evoke the original transformative hopes of modernity, contrary to much now accumulated evidence. Place, the constructed poem, including page space, becomes a stretch of time, the time of potential transformation or of accounting via language and cognition. The poet becomes the shamanic, analytic, speaking subject and object of modernity itself. A long poem is a vast allegory of investigation. By virtue of scale, by virtue of scale, the long poem is certainly a mode of resistance to the lyricization of poetry, by which I don't mean against the lyric, by the way, a narrowing of interest in and knowledge of poetic genres that Virginia Jackson argues is a now dominant reading strategy, but a lens that is also a limitation. There are other versions of this point. If there are lyric elements or sections in long poems, the long poem engorges them, changes them, makes them one among many genres. Barabajan poems of Brathway does this on an epistemological paradigm shifting scale with special folk font, visual text, essay, document, polemic, and poems. Works by Waldman, Wick, Williams, B.P. Nickel do this also. Any genre taxonomy is a way of gaining, getting multiplicity and function back into this discussion, not reducing the long poem to a collection of lyrics or an epic as Wikipedia Dorley tells us, based on um, prior, prior criticism. Charles Olson's extraordinary sense that he was inventing a way of theorizing language, culture, history, and society, and thus inventing a synthesis of intellectual fields by means of the long poem, however overstated and grandiose, announces some stakes for long poem ambitions. A long poem, then, might be a theorizing practice in verse, a map or essay of discovery for the writer, a book of productivity and bildung for the reader. There are many kinds of mod con long poems. My implicit ideal cases are enormous books with a capital B by one person somehow self-elected to present a summary book of thinking and seeing to the culture. This malarmé but impure book, in length, accumulation, evaluation, and loose ends everywhere, has many analogs among poems of the linguistically innovative, my child here, um, mode, speculation, pile-up of evidence, and the sense that honest sightings will form a complex field or constellation do contrast these projects with the singularity and poise of the discrete lyric in Jeff Hilson's words. Some long poems attempt totality, such as Pound, Olson, Crane, and even in his own luckily uneven way, Williams, with belatedly ersatz Gesamtkunstwerk claims, belatedly and ersatz because they gesture, but they can't possibly do this, um, as if they're moving into hypertext or cinema, uh, you know, a tribute of hats off to uh, last night's plenary, but you, Gesamtkunstwerk means all the genres that are this stuff together, visual, music, so it's sort of fake. <laughs> Um, although you, you could use Gesamtkunstwerk, except for the fact that you don't have music and you don't have um, visual, except metaphorically. However, P. 
people attempting the long haul now, like Ron Sullivan, Alan Fisher, Cameron Brathwaite, are writing after the collapse of unified, totalizing theories in their modernist literary avatars. It's an interesting situation to be creating a monumental work while resisting both the apparent benefits and the problematics of monumentality, not to speak of the illusions of totality. Reading long poems is a process filled with critical troubles. Not the least is devising reading methods for the question of scale. In this survey foray taking place now, the language uses of long poems get put to the side in favor of simply grasping them in a generalized, maybe shamefully extractive reading here about genres and practices. We need this reading, but we must also doubt it, dump it, burrow under it in favor of some practice corresponding more to Gertrude Stein's challenge, why don't you read the way I write? Which <laughs> um, begs the question, how is that? <laughs> <laughs> Suggestions of reading strategies from Joan Metallic, Peter Quartermain, Charles Bernstein, and maybe Roland Bach are on the table. A readerly poesis, as Metallic says, a situated, not finalized, responsive reading honoring poeticity, the specificity of the text, but also the reader's phenomenological and productive intelligence, thinking with the poem in Quartermain's terms. You bring your context to it, situationally responding to structures, forms, genres, historical relevance, a reading, a reading strategy rejecting any lockstep findings. Such a reading will show how poeticity in every situated reading moment creates and intensifies acts of cognition. In the criticism of poetry to explore how the aesthetic and the cognitive are generally simultaneous with the author, primary elements and dialectically fused is always the largest challenge. Allowing this move in the reader too is not sentimentalism and cannot of course preclude ongoing learning and research. However, this paper does not integrate its discussion of genre and mode, fundamentally semantic structural issues, with much discussion of poeticity, fundamentally, fundamentally a semiotic or a sem semantic semiotic issue, but all are necessary. One anecdote crystallizes long poem troubles, numbers, genres, and encounters. After Ezra Pound's crucial edits of the wasteland, removing narrative elements and any um, imitative elements like Pope, Paolo Fresco, or Joyce, a la the He Do the Police in Different Voices, allowing its queerish gender ambiguity and haunted revenants to exfoliate, and before Eliot controlled that ambiguity by adding, without Pound's knowledge or approval, his six pages of distancing, authority claiming endnotes Pound announced to Eliot that this then 19-page poem was, let us say, the longest poem in the English language. Yeah. Which as in widget, that's Pound. <laughs> Pound was making familiar modernist jibes, both at the long poem past, sidelighting Chaucer, Spencer, Milton, Pope, Blake, Byron, Wordsworth, and Whitman, and loosely at narrative poetry. Whether joke, tall tale, or consoling lie, the Anglophone modern long poem begins with Pound's overstatement. Why and how do people begin long poems? When do they know? By what measures do they define poems as long as Pound did with Eliot's? Why do they say their work came out as long as this? What is the technical or, or critical vocabulary used to identify length and scale? Is it time, space? Sublimity, everything, perpetuity of practice, disobedience and boundlessness? Have the poets considered or discussed hard whole relationships as a component of length, toggling specific units of praxis? What is the relationship between length and ending as a structural and ideological idea? Do the poets' concepts, visions, or practices of length change during the writing and how? And who have they encountered among the other, other artists or writers, particularly of long works? What conversations are they entering with works on a scale? To whose challenges are they responding in this encounter? We need to try some analytic mechanisms to consider these poems as more than one by one supernova. Okay, 
those are questions, and I, I will have questions, questions periodically through this paper, but don't expect any answers. <laughs> encounters. Thinking of encounters demands interpretive clusters of long poems. Often a model work or set of earlier works provoke a challenge on new, a newer work. One can make intense constellations of these encounters, and people, you know, you can do a lot of them. Insofar as poems are always filled with aggression and homage, always talking to each other, these critical aesthetic sites indicate traces of conversations in sociopoesis. Some examples. The cosmological long poem, beginning with Dante's Commedia, let's say, might seem to be obsolete, but surprise, the following works up on the board are visibly, textually, and conceptually connected to it, if not directly to each other. H.G.'s double-sided coin, rewriting to basic, basic Western myths, four quartets, 80 flowers, and then there are three quite different contemporaries, Merrill, whom I've already mentioned, John Kinsler's bluntly titled Divine Comedy, and Bruce Andrews Lip Service, all making distinctive, saturated uses of Dante. Derek Walcott also pursues Dante in his generally unrhymed Terza Rima, and a decided riff on Inferno late in Omeros, which obviously is not only about Dante. <laughs> One exemplary psychosocial long poem is The Transformative Wasteland, and as we saw last night, by everything including Chris Marker, Eliot does have legs. Discussions of the wasteland abound, many proposing resistance to and critique of its findings. Williams did so several times, at least in Spring and All, with direct allusions and rewritings, and in Patterson. Pounds Cantos briefly acknowledged that work. Hart Craig's The Bridge was a direct response. So too Zukowski's Beginning Love and Olson's The Kiss Hope Muriel's 1919 Paris prefigured it in part. Nancy Cunard's 1925 Parallax was so totally close as to be an act of identification. The historical diagnostic long poem could not have been written without the examples of Whitman and Pound, further propelled by Williams and Olson. All of the documentary serial poem, like Reznikov's, and poems revamping an echt epic or griot told heroic struggle, cum wound, like Walcott's, seem to come from other chains of encounter. There's a pedagogic aspect to long poems in this strand. Melvin Tolson and Tade Ipadeola both insist that we need, and collectively, to face the histories of Africa. The poem, including history, has, a, has distinct political and cultural traditions that need particularized tracing. For instance, Tom McGrath or Hugh McDermott or David Jones, tales or allegories of what tribe and what interesting words Pound, again, chose, including history and tales of the tribe. I'm going to make sure now that I'm on, I think I'm on the right path here in the PowerPoint. Cutting across this, ta this taxonomy, which is cosmological, psychosocial, historical, diagnostic, clusters of work identified by global purpose of all of those together, the Maximus poems, like the Kentos, like the Barabasian poems, position themselves as new secular cultures, or even sacred texts of those secular cultures, synoptic and syncretic works of tallying and assessment with the goals of spiritual, historical, and loosely psychosocial transformation. Making such a synthesis has a kind of one-person band feel, at once an act of performance, analysis, diagnosis, and mastery. Tolson's libretto is an incredible act like this. Waldman's Jovis is as well. Sometimes such works are imperial, claiming to be substitutes for the rest of your library, a condensation of the important texts, Pound's sacred anthology idea. Plus, extra credit for this, long poems may necessitate glosses like Butterings, Carol Terrells, reference books, glossaries. Sometimes they assemble a different necessary unseen archive, as does Brathwaite or Susan Howe. The new secular culture poem is a contradictory mimicry, both of the imperial thrust of world history during this time and of the loss of authority of the most gloss-laden book in our culture, some version of the Bible. This goal bespeaks the intellectual cultural thrust in modernity toward syncretism and also toward channeling speech of the lost. These mixes present definite contradictions. 
A one person made fake sacred book substitutes for a desacralized, formerly sacred book, and imperial, imperious sets of citations and allusions both honor and appropriate worldwide materials. In some cases, cultural respect and cosmopolitan awareness result. Other cases show a, an acontextual imperial claim on others' cultures and myths. In fact, a number of modern long poems are attempts at post-national synthesis, often, as Matt Hart pointedly indicates, with a symptomatic mix of cosmopolitan and secular, and, sorry, secular, vernacular, excuse me, Matt, dictions. These may borrow and remix from a variety of cultures, as does Z's A, The Wasteland, The Cantos, Tulsa's Harlem Gallery and his libretto, Mackey's Song of the Anamulu, Waldman's Yogis, or they may work as citation recombination strategies from modern scientific, engineering, research, sociological, pop culture, languages, and jargons, as do Tony Lopez, Alan Fisher, Steve McCaffrey, Clark Coolidge, Barrett, Barrett Run, and Bruce Andrews. Some long poems try to investigate universalisms by assembling and channeling this totalizing claim and end by being both contradictorily imperial and post-nationalist. There's another mode of long poem that investigates one socio-cultural compact, Olson, Williams, Crane, Brathwaite, McDermott, John Kinsella, Kinsella, sorry, Roy, Roy Fisher, Basil Bunting, but often with a synthetic absorptive position. Williams' local as universal is more than just a corny motto. Once you add length and scale, the local synthesis and the universalizing synthesis start approaching each other. A long poem can thus feel imperious, trying to claim too much, intervene in too many fields at once, remake too many cultural compacts, and claim your allegiance or your disgust too forcefully. Excess is a motif. Genres and cognition. Is genre identification an adequate way of constructing any typology? Here I'm borrowing and extending the typology of Smaro Camborelli, along with her sense of hybrid polyphonic genre mixes as characteristic of long poems. But all genre categories also suggest potential structures and also are centered in slightly different poetics and finally demand speculation about the cognitive aspects of this choice of genre. If the materials of the literary, of poetry, are always modes of thought, these terms offer a frame for the nature and movement of thought in each poem. The question becomes, if their commitment migrates into structure or form, those aren't the same, but you know what I mean, how does any particular genre represent or conflict with any specific content? The problem of these genres hanging in formalist space here is that the cultural and social functions of the genres historically particular to each poem are only thinly acknowledged in this quick coming taxonomy. This might be solved by overgeneralizing, assuming as I seem to that the modern long poem, modern long poems appear in some aftermath in alternative or symbiotic relations to the crises of modernity, nation states and imperialisms, Wars called world wars, World War I, which I agree, is as a break, a national mass murder and repeated, not just one or two, genocides, world encompassing development, extraction, exploitation, and profit. My goal in this taxonomy is sheer grouping for some legibility. One. Narrative, musical, often mythic works. H.D. Fitzgerald, Notley, Merrill, Ronald Johnson's Ark, Melvin Tolson with Libretto for Liberia, Tade Padaola again, Ashbury, Three Poems, Art Crane the Bridge, often with a post personal sensibility telling a generally transformative story of hope against odds with myths of quest or investigation motivating the speaker. The speaker is both archive and archivist and might have a cosmological interface. Obviously, Ashbury ironizes this. Trouble in this category, cues, montage, quasi-narrative, musical, but it's not a mythic quest. It's a specifically social quest. Two, hyperspace encyclopedic epics in big quotation marks. Pound, Olson, Brathwaite, 
Ann Waldman, David Jones, the anathemata, Alan Fisher, Gravity, Williams Patterson, Maurice Phillips, Song. Resolutely social, often epic in size, meaning only very long, but sometimes alluding to epically metaphoric battles or historical struggles, highly accumulative and documentary, filled with loose ends and vectors, not from Maurice Phillips, actually, and a, a transformed nation's nationhood, even if imaginary, is often an issue for these works. Again, Zahn is the other side of the nation. Trouble in this category, Oppen's epic topics, including war and gnosis, occur in resolutely non-epic modes in the being numerous. You can see my strategy is making categories and then throwing them over. Three, works of seriality. Stein, Stanzas, Loy, as I think this, sorry, Anglo Mongols, Oppen of King Numerous, Hughes Montage, Creeley Pieces, Spicer, Kassim, Thomas McGrath's Letter to an Imaginary Friend, Robert Kirch, Completed Field Notes, Linda Janine, Osoka Hoto. Seriality, which a lot of people here have been defining for a while, is a mode of thinking in decidedly sectioned poems, often some, with some lyric interface that join disparate materials along a temporal metamorphic line of investigation. More modest, more contained in its scale than epic or mythic claims, often presented as individual soundings in a specific time and place, and bleeding enough into the next category, and that itself is trouble in the category. Four, Odic Log Books of Continuance. Blazer, Mackey, B.P. Nickel, Martyrology, Maurice Scully, The Things That Happened, Larry Eidner's Oeuvre, taken as a log book, debatable, but interesting, Beverly Dolan, a reading, Ashbury flowchart and drafts, and Silliman, where is he? Is universe here? Longer or endless temporality works constructed via serial units, but having a longer time frame of composition than serial works generally do in the above. So the soundings, lifelong, have an engorging, sometimes encyclopedic or log book sensibility, taking everything in. The word odic calls attention to the sometimes decidedly ecstatic tone amid everydayness. Here, wholeness is an effect, not a goal. Exception, flowchart works in joint verse paragraphs, not in serial units. Trouble in the category, Virginia's My Life, a procedural work hinting at, but not actually performing, log book continuance. Five, new realist, sometimes procedurals. William Spring and All is an originating theory practice hybrid. Silliman's The Alphabet, Virginia and My Life, Watt in Progress, Lopez, Only More So, Ammons, Take for the Turn of the Year, Giles, I hope that's right, Goodland, A Spy in the House of Years, Bernadette Mayer, Midwinter Day. One sees here a debate about the subject I, often dissolved in a plethora of other discourses that have made the socio-historical surround in which subjectivity is saturated to the point where sometimes it simply disappears and other times it moves around. The procedural becomes both diagnosis and symptom. I can no longer organize much except for each poem. The single lens gives way to the procedures prompting accumulation. Finally, stories, straight, mocked, or queered, updated epics or grafted, in Romana Hoek's word, resistant epics, no quotation marks. Walcott, Homeros, Kenneth Koch, Sharon Dubiago, Brathwaite Ancestors, Gwendolyn Brooks, The Aneid. There are characters, there's a tale, there's some turning point, the whole may be earnest or ironic. This is also naggingly unsatisfying that it's only used as pedagogic, focused on borders, when my real claim, like Camparelli's, runs counter to these borders, the claim that the poems are constructed in genre crossings, or extensive allusions to or eclectic eruptions of other modes, precisely because modernity 
represents plethoric and metamorphosis, impurity, intertextuality, overload, and interior exile without regard for convention. There's some of those words are from Moretti. Genre interpenetration, collage, collision include genre collage. The traces and temporalities of generic allusions and the social meanings of the mix create a choreography of some intensity as readers are pulled as they read by conflicting genre expectations, including whatever fictions around um, uh, the, the movement to the end. Should we still want any genre definition? Maybe we can have a ghost taxonomy, but no final definitions. This endless putting in and taking out of category, which I'm sure you're doing in your heads because you disagree with half of where I put things. <laughs> and that would be right, actually. It mimics the endless cultural acts of the long poem itself, creolized, inclusive, errant, omnivorous, palimpsestic, overwritten with more writing. Once the ideological basis of true epic in fighting tribes is historically moot, we think, long poems take an investigative turn, the dissolution of heroic, unifying, dynamic, but above all, nation-like claims into metropolitan and cosmopolitan, some of the question whether an epic level loss can ever be rectified. Genres have not been considered culturally equal, exclamation point. There's a conventional hierarchy, as Susan Friedman pointed out in her discussion of gender and epic. A hierarchy of bigger meaning better that any focus on the long poem risks replicating. The genre mixage characteristic of mod con long poems tries to rupture the hierarchy of value. Mikhail's book reveals, for example, a storm of genres in each work he discusses. The various individual poems' genre shifts are part of the social shifts evoked within the reading experience. So, so genre talk of this descriptive ilk doesn't get at, maybe even will tame, the downright weirdness and unassimilable nature of the long poem, its contradictory desire to create some kind of a totality while making a critique of various kinds of wholeness and to create universality of sorts while investing in local specificities. Long poems are, however, not limitable, limitable by or to genre study. They are, as my Duncan citation at first said, modes of practice, activities of ongoing, driven making. This thought leads to a looser calculation based on time, space, and perhaps ending. Note this, this three-unit taxonomy forthcoming will explicitly remix placements of works appearing both in my category of encounters and in my genre sliding just above by using numbers. Yet these numbers are neither ordinal nor cardinal, not heft and scale, not space and time, but conceptual, linguistic space, and linguistic time. When these words go into play, however, I find myself saying things like, Long poems take space and turn it into time, or take time and turn it into space. <laughs> Both are defensible, if idiotic, and slightly useless remarks unless we further specify. Category one is the mode of the lifelong poem, using Ron Sullivan's term, the long poem, one word, no space, as the indicator of that fact, lifelong poem or the acronym VLP, Peter Middleton's Very Long Poem. <laughs> this work doesn't actually have to take one's whole life, but it has to take many years, indeed decades, as a career-consuming project. That time investment usually results in a single named poem in multiple sections, probably published over many years, in multiple se separate books, but contributing to one book. It is work done on a daunting scale, the scale of archive, library, midden, churned up attic, plus the stepwise recording of the life of persons or places or times or all of these. These lifelong poems tend to be conceptualized as an investigative or experimental project, like a gigantic site sculpture or scrapbook, built in specific, variable, but long unrolling acts of facture in Alan Fisher's word. The scale is often city-sized, a world metropolis with lots of power struggles, many social groups, and few zoning laws. 
Obviously, an island or region for Breathwaite may also be the geopoetical basis. A selected list of lifelong poems, long poems, sorry, irrespective of theme, style, and findings, would, and most of these have been up on the, on the deck, so I'm not going to need them, would include the Cantos, Patterson, A, the Maximus Poems, Image Nations, the Martyrology of E.P. Nichol, Alan Fisher's Gravity, David Anton's happily ongoing talk poems, a long project which incidentally the University of New Mexico Press is about to reprint, the alphabet and the un and universe, and, sorry, the alphabet and universe all slotted into Silliman's proleptic ultimate super cat jam. Um, I can talk about that if you want. That's supposed to be sort of a joke, but it, it isn't really. A <laughs> super cat jam, a reading by Dahlem, Song of the End of Blue, incorporating Moo of Mackie, Drafts, Jovis, and um, others. Stephen Collis has embarked on the Barricades Project, and it's also on the Barricades. Barabasian Poems is a magisterial encyclopedic work with a terminus. Ronald Johnson's arc, concluding and carefully architectonic, but published seriatim over 20 years, is a rare instance of a lifelong, long poem that ends. Zukovsky's A is another, Sort of. Jovis is a third, but Walden is not, not sure of why it ended. Drafts is temporizing. The second large category of long poems includes book length long poems, work presented as a single longish book, even with the aura of capital B book, but focused on a single cultural intervention and not demanding a near lifetime to read and perhaps to write. In general, these works are scaled to the human body and to social di dialogues the way that Renaissance proportions work. Stein's tender buttons could be put here, the two long poems of H.G., Eliot's Pascal's Winter, Four Quartets, McDermott's A Drunk Man Looks at a Thistle, Melvin Tolson's poignantly unfinished Harlem Gallery, he died, David Jones' Anathemata, Gwendolyn Brooks' Annie, and Lisa Robertson's Debbie and Epic, Stephen McCaffrey's The Black Debt, Recent books by Alice Notley, Descent of Alette, Reason and Other Women are parallel interventions. And I could go on because, and I, I should also mention the tablets by Arnold Schwerner. In fact, most long poems fit here, and I should also acknowledge Drift by Carolyn Berval that you might be hearing um, later or tomorrow, which is a very, it's a work exactly like this kind of work. This kind of work is novel or novella length and has generally taken years, but not decades. Being about some things only, not about everything, or if about everything, nonetheless, stop it. Nigel Alderman has suggested the word, the term pocket epic for this group. I confess to an allergic reaction to the word epic used as a blurry synonym for long. So for me, this term comes down to the very helpful but oxymoronish shorter, long. <laughs> However, his definitions are precise and on target. These works are not unfinished, ever-expanding structures, the other ones, but works simultaneously suggesting an ambitious project of mapping some form of totality and its deliberate restriction. The analytic question is what, in each case, cues deliberate restriction, and that is the question. In a third quite debatable and capricious category, I'd include honorific, nanorific long poems, game-changing interventions that, although extremely short, are considered long because of having an explosive cultural effect. Their impact crater is quite deep, a measure apparently standing in for long. Right now, in my view, the nanorific long poem includes Mallarmé's Anchor Today, Elliot's The Wasteland, Allen Ginsberg's Howl, perhaps Oppen's of being numerous. So, to long time, long results in category one, lifelong, creating multiple poem done over many years or even decades, and long enough space in category two, book length bigness and cultural intervention, two quite unstable measures of long. We have to add, currently viewed as culturally necessary and Historically important for some socio-poetic rupture for a capricious category three. Okay, I think we've got the slide. Let's see. No. Not yet. 
Can one distinguish these three by types of endings? Yes and no. Here I have cut several paragraphs that try to distinguish endings, but in describing them, I actually discover that this is a reading effect of wishful thinking to validate my categories. I want them to be different than they are, but endlessness, sibling comment, and trailing off or future orientation are not that demonstrably different among them. So let's discontinue this line of thought and go right on to numbers down for the count. Commenting on his long poem, this is my favorite slide. <laughs> see. Okay. Commenting on his long poem A, Louis Zukowski proposed a seamless continuum between short and long by implicitly emphasizing language, sort of, you'll hear in a second, the intensity of multiple verbal resonances. Asked to distinguish short from long, he said, a long poem is merely more of a good thing. <laughs> I'll repeat that. A long poem, and that's his emphasis, is merely more of a good thing. Certainly witty, Zukowski's remark is deliberately disingenuous because the length of long is not a measurement of either time or space, heft or muchness. His more conceals or alludes to a conceptual bolus evoking intense and persistent, if not always consistent, authorial choices of linguistic cultural activity, his good thing. It is an investment in and a struggle with ongoing, sometimes fierce poesis going the distance. These choices are emphatically career moves in Libby Rifkin's phrase. Richly fantasized desires and strategies, investments in one's analyses and diagnoses, Evaluations of the poetic field as it exists now and in the past, tests of cultural majority, temptations of by the yard extent, instantiations of ambition, a drive for majorness via scale, the risk of a reader's feeling swamped, even a writer's feeling thus, a feeling of being in over your head, a struggle with the very compulsion to do this, these just listed impulses and desires to make something are not just longer than a short poem of feeling. In a way, they are less safe. Not that safe, not that consumable. What could go wrong? And so we return to the persistent adjective long, and to the persistent word length, and to the question of naming numbers, which may be pages, measurements, time, or the amoral, immeasurable quality of desire that we call ambition or pleasure, the pleasure of making such a text, the pleasure of the book overflowing a book. In Peter Milton's brilliant phrase, which I envy so much that I could practically foam at the mouth when I say it, the longing of the long poem, the longing for unachievable goals. The key word here is scale, but there's no agreed upon measuring code. So how long is long in the long poem? This question seems to be fundamental and definitional. It is actually pataphysical and unanswerable, something already well noted by both Peter Middleton in Jacket 40 and Jacob Edmund in a deliberately and wonderfully absurdist paper. So you just have to feast your eyes on this unsystematic presentation. <clears throat> Some more pragmatic observations that I don't have up there. The so-called longest poem in the English language is only 25 pages long, and Coup de Day by Malamé is 11 pages long, with plenty of white space. Opens of being numerous is 26 pages. Howl is between 10 and 20 pages. Obviously, different editions counting pages. It's totally ridiculous to do this. And why not enumerate time? That is time of composition, trilogy took three years. Auden's New Year letter at 44 pages took four months. The Cantos took about 60 years. And Silliman, we see about 40 years to date and counting. Letter to an imaginary friend took 13 years. Drafts took 26 years. Maurice Scully's The Things That Happened took 25. So time doesn't help either. Still, rather than making a fetish, comic or anxious of some cutoff number or another for, for defining the large and long. 
A more useful critical exercise would be to identify the claims in poetics or practice made by the poet about the poems like their scale, as well as the meanings of their numerological illusions, of which there are a number, of a, to 100 or to 24, or to one's age of composition, or to 360, or to 1,000, or any other, other number. For numbers can become talismanic in a thematic and structural way. Literary numbers are cultural and ideological artifacts, as meter is, for instance, and some numbers have had long shelf lives as suggesting or illustrating worldviews. For although we are no longer living in Dante's spiritual universe, nor within Homer's epic with its 24 books, these numbers plus concepts from modern science can infuse poems interestingly. Fractals seem to work in Alan Fisher, but don't ask me how yet. Olympian schemes and procedural numerology in loosely language poetries. Numbers are electric with both traditional and potential meanings, hence our power sources, if you can manage to instantiate them effectively. Long poem writers who use numbers in variously echt numerological ways include Elliot Quartets, Zukowski, at least in 80 Flowers, but in punctual moments in A, H.D. loosely in trilogy, Pound changeably in the cantos, Ronald Johnson assiduously in arc, Silliman voraciously as with the Fibonacci series, Hygienian with structural panache around biography, Mackey mysteriously as two long poems fused into two, as he says. There are undoubtedly more. Of course, there are lots that have no numerology one can easily identify, but it is an interesting place to think of doing work. Often a long poem has been motivated by an almost stunningly simple mechanism or necessity. This is actually not surprising, as they generally have an ide fixe undercarriage. The answer to why any poem is this long may be as simple as having a culturally enormous topic, the Trojan War, plus a major method, the psychoanalysis of that war in HD, or the enslavement of Africans, the resultant diaspora and its ratifications, and Maggie with East Philip. As simple as having already existing culturally challenging long novels and proving you are capable of meeting that challenge. Homer and Joyce for Pound and Walcott, Dante for Merrill, Kinsella and Andrews, and so on. As simple as having an inexhaustible, inexhaustible feelings of plethora, quote, to find an image large enough to embody the whole noble world around me, Williams and Sullivan. A sense of world-shifting crises of modernity that cannot be mastered or analyzed except by your research, Olson, Pound, Brathwaite. The ways having an ongoing project can always open the space for more writing. B.P. Nickel, Mackey, Critch. A desire dynamically to animate a sealed or unrecognized archive of findings and put a mound of different materials in the human account to confront normal knowledge, Olson. Howe, McGrath, Waldman, Tolson, Notley. A passionate poesis of new language combinations, Andrews, McGlow, McCaffrey, Watton, Lopez, Coolidge. Actually, many people writing long poems mix a number of these motives together. Probably for all of these people, one fundamental motive was a big, if somewhat variously visible, ambition. Ambition to make this mark. Another motive would be seeing how long this long poem mode could absorb and buoy whatever you found yourself saying or needed to address for a very long time. The writing of a long poem has a private temporality. It's a bit like deliberately painting oneself into a corner and then constructing more of the building out from that corner <laughs> and continuing to paint. <laughs> the writing of a long poem goes on and on. It is a second life. The diagnosis of some modern catastrophe figured variously in these poets is followed by the awakening and reorganization of the cultural brain in the poem. It's as if you've built a somewhat other country and culture and brain next to the real social one, as well as another life next to your own. So a long poem builds oneself a parallel life and time, a parallel universe of being. This is the Shahrazad motif, staying alive like one of Woody Allen's jokes about death. 
Finding out what poets themselves think about their long poem projects, how they began, why, etc., and all those questions I was asking, and evaluating these critically are more useful ways than raw numbers or raw taxonomies to understand long poem practice and poetics, even if inevitably concluding thus. Miles Davis to John Coltrane. Why did you go on so long? <laughs> Coltrane. It took that long to get it all in. <laughs> It's really 
a strange, it is a wonderful question and sort of a strange one at the same time because <laughs> poets are very used to the question, how did you know when it ended? Right. And you just sort of like, well, uh, you know, that's what being a poet is about. You, you understand what you're doing enough to know that this stopped and this is going to go on, something like that. So I think that the answer is a little bit implicit in what I said, meaning you've got to ask the poets, because the people here who've been writing long poems sometimes are writing short poems at the same time, and other times are not. Okay, and I think it's a question of an individuated praxis at that point. For example, you know, speaking biographically, I did not write any short poems except maybe three occasional poems that I was asked, you know, to, to write for 26 years. So everything was drafted. Well, that's what I was wondering about, really, yeah. is, is how it's so all-consuming, you can't really get out of that other world, but, unless you want to be three people or four. Well, you know, it's, that's, that's interesting. I mean, in many ways, in many ways, it's, it's a very hard question because it is, I mean, if, if any of the poets in this audience have a little help on the side, I would be happy to take it because it really is an individual question. Um, you know, it's like asking, well, how did you know what to title this poem? And then how did you know that that was the end of this poem? Or how did you know what moves to make in this poem and when it stopped and when it was another poem? It's just what you do when you're a poet, right? You're making these judgment calls right. and choices all the time and you're like, reading and writing meaning you're reading your own writing for the assessment of what it is that you're doing, whether it's adequate to your dream or vision or concept. Or I guess I was hoping for some practical advice because I tend to write very long things and then they get longer and longer. And so, you know, but, but I, I understand what you're saying, that the things that don't make it, make their way into the poem, uh, they, they might find it other place. But are there poets who want to talk about it? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is sort of um, meant to be somewhat humorous, but how did you know when drafts started? <laughs> and because there was an interview that I did with you that you were quite articulate about that, and it did have something to do with Robert Duncan, and I did notice that Robert Duncan's serial poems did not make it in the list. So I thought you liked that contentiousness. No, no, it wasn't, it wasn't from um, dislike of Duncan, God knows. Right. Duncan said, and this is why I kind of honored his presence by, by mentioning him twice, Duncan wrote two ongoing serial poems that were deposited uh, periodically and punctually in his ongoing works. One is The Structure of Rhyme, and one is, quick, my global mind, uh, Passages, yes, sorry. When you're up here, you never remember anything. And, and, um, many people, including Peter Quartermain, who just edited brilliantly the California edition of Duncan, um, pushed on Duncan in a way, isn't this a long poem? Aren't you going to put it separately as a long poem or two long poems? And he was obdurate, absolutely obdurate, no. So that's why Duncan did not make it on this list, because I was honoring, in effect, his own choice that everything that he wrote was in effect one long poem. But I'm not, that's a hard thing to defend, except I sort of said that Larry, I never mind about that. And I just, Duncan wrote poems which had names that were separate from other poems with names and then woven through as two threads. It's really a remarkable practice with these two serial poems. That's, it was just to be accurate about Duncan. There wasn't anything. How did I know when I began drafts? I, I kind of, you know, as it proceeds, and 26 years is kind of a long time ago, actually 28 now because I stopped it. You know, um, two things came together at the same time, and finally I, could, I knew my mind and what I was doing well enough to separate them. And it was uncannily like Moore, her two um, sort of not long, long, long poems, but Odic works, um, you know, the, the one about Mount Rainier and the, you know, the, the other the two, an octopus, they were simultaneous. And somehow knowing this about more, it's so strange, allowed me to disengage drafts one and two. And um, I sort of saw 
you know, it was it and she. And then I realized, and this is, you know, this sort of the precipitate was separating these two things as different things. In other words, hearing yourself, which is an answer to the question that you raised, you have to know how to hear yourself, which is a lifelong pursuit. It doesn't happen in a minute. And it's very hard and it's really painful when you can't do it yet, when, which is incredible. When other people are doing it and you can't do it, you know. Uh, I mean, it's not about making, like writing, it's about hearing what you're doing. So I could hear it finally, and then when I separated them, I realized, and this is such a the joke, and Alan, this, you know, this is a joke for Alan, there's a lot of it out there, and she will have to deal with it. And that's exactly, that was, the, that was sort of the precipitated, and she means me, of course. And uh, that was one, and the second was just getting the rubric draft, which was sort of like ketchup for Ron an infinitely generative word, which is so incredible. You know, from the outside, ketchup certainly doesn't necessarily look like that word. It's kind of tally, like mantra, like talismanic. Drafts might, but you know, 114 plus one poems from that one word is kind of magical, and that's just what happened. So my practice involves titling, um, which has to also be linked to being entitled to do this work. In this, you know, like a, you know, that's a gender component probably. And um, when the title precipitates the work in a funny way by declaring the space of the work, that's my explanation of my practice. It doesn't have necessarily anything to do with any other long poem or poet's practice. That's that's why you have to do this work, like untangling all these people what they say about about it, which is what I'm kind of calling for. Thanks, Jean. Hi, okay, so I was thinking about the things you're saying about long and longish and, and all those kinds <laughs> of distinctions. And then I was thinking, what about the distinction between the creative and the critical? And oh, yeah. like Eric Watton's work, Zora work, um, Mount Rathway's, you do critical and creative. So what goes into the, the long book and what goes into the book and the critical? Why are you people asking me these hard questions? <laughs> it's, it's, an, it's very impossible to say, except, you know, a, to be critical in a critical setting is a professional practice. And if you do it, you have to be professional enough to manage to do it. The overlap, the, the link between my poetry and my critical work is probably reading meaning reading in-depth reading of poetry for the for all the stuff in it so that I'm able to to see what I'm doing or also um, look at what I don't understand what I'm doing and understand that I'm, I can let that go because I'll find out later or I have to or I have to analyze it and know it now and making the constructive choice which one to do you know with it Overanalyze, or whether to just understand that something is percolating and you don't, you know. So, the, the one thing about being a poet critic is it, it kind of takes up all your waking hours, meaning that to do a, a, a professional work in academia, which we all do, or most of us do, but to do professional writing, which all of us must do um, if we're sitting here. And to do to to do poetry, which is an unrewarded um, enterprise in a lot of realms, um, is a very complicated balancing act. And um, the only reason, the only way I can say that I did it is that I don't watch television. <laughs> I, I, I simply no. I'm, I'm actually, and people say, "Are you sure you don't watch the news?" I said, "No, it's because it doesn't. The whole thing of it doesn't interest me, but it gives you a lot more time." <laughs> Okay, no, no, no. 
I was sort of quoting, I, I was mocking Pound, actually, who, who had clearly overlooked when he said to Elliot this fake sort of thing that he said, uh, kind of self preening but also praise of Elliot. It's the longest poem in the English language. It was, it was a complete, it's wrong. It's totally, totally wrong. And I'm just amused by that wrongness. I think that in the encounters section of my paper, you could do an amazing thing with the prelude. You could do an amazing thing with Whitman. That has already in part been done with the long poem. You know, encounters with these figures. Um, of course, I think they're long poems. I mean, it, it, no, no. You guys, one, one, I guess one question I had is this long poem as a critical category emerge only after sort of the like, extreme minimal reduction of you know, Pound and HD going to, say, a fragment of Sappho as you, if you can have a right. poem that's three lines, then the long poem is sort of like the bounce back against it's a, that. That's a great question because, if, um, it, I mean, it's a great observation because there is a mystery about the fact that the seed, when you, when you got to that minimalism of images and so on, it somehow, for Pound and others, generates the long poem. Of in this, and I don't think it's just a reaction, action, reaction. I don't really bounce back. It's not quite it. It's almost like it's a seed, um, like the word, you know, drafts, or like song of the animal blue as a as a term that just exfoliated. And um, Pound talks about that when, in um, in Gordia de Yesco when he talks about the haiku, and then it, it somehow gets to the long poem. And I've been trying to figure that out for my whole career, like how he crosses that gap. So that just, um, you know, it's sort of in the your question is like another instantiation of the fact that we, there's a mystery in that that we don't fully understand. That's all I can. Mean. And I'm not trying to mystify. No, no, no. And so my question is that I think it is related to modernism in, in that sense. I mean, it, yeah. it's related to what happened. You know? Well, you know, but the category is the modern long poem, the anglophone modern long poem. It's not all the long poems that were written in English or something like that. But. And I do think of it as a break, and I think of it as a break very much like because of modernity. I mean, that's the point that I was making, um, even on the generalizing. There's something started happening with modernity with both overload and with crises of um, that it, modernity was supposed to be great. I mean, just to be simple-minded about it. Um, and it turned out not so great. And I think that, you know, if, throughout, you know, ever since World War One, but possibly just a little, you know, people weren't, imperialism really was a problem, and the, you know, the race issues were a problem, enslavement and what, you know, capitalism was a problem. All of these things started getting, like, looming, like a um, golem, bigger and bigger and bigger in modernity, and then World War One, you know, then you really saw how, you know, that that was really a crisis. I totally agree with, um, I think it was Colin McCabe last night, excuse me if I'm wrong, who said that, and uh, you know, Chris Marker from the Ministry, clear and so on. And then you have World War II, even, even worse, if that could possibly be imagined. And so the modern long poem keeps on keeping on to try to recuperate something out of this um, ruin. I mean, this is why Eliot is still so important, because he, said he already intuited that um, in his own way, and he chickened out on it, actually, in my view, but never mind about that. Could you bring the mic down to your mouth? Thank you. Um, oh, so yeah. yesterday, at one of the, thank you for that delightful talk. But yesterday, at one of the talks about Marianne and Moore talk, um, brought up the point that uh, modernist poetry um, they breaks, has some tactical breaks in the line that, in a way that, you know, in the yeah, late, Chris, Chris the late so right, yeah. in the late 19th century didn't do as much, right? So. Um, I'm going with that idea of numbers that you brought up at the, toward the end of your talk. Um, in the descent of Alette, um, you know, she uses punctuation to create sort of a unit of words or, or a collection of like maybe one word but, or, or a phrase. So I was just wondering, um, based on that and the line as sort of a unit in a poem, how does that relate to your discussion about Numbers and length. Yeah. That's, that's a good question, and I, you know, just would have to say, um, Alison Alley's Alette, um, 
there are a couple of different aspects to it. It's a very unique choice of um, pulsing, the, pulsing the line out in a different way while also using line break and stanza break as well as section break. So there's a lot of um, things you can, you know, kind of stutter forward um, aspect to Alain. I don't, I think it's a unique instance. It's not actually prosodically um, an instance that anyone else has taken up in part because um, it has so much to do with her theme. Um, I think the larger question has to do with prosody, syntax, section, so the relationship of section to length. A lot of the poems that I'm talking about, um, Alain is not, but a lot are prosodically um, very various. They use prose, they interrupt, they have the Patterson. Um, you, they have weird bits, literally things that you could have published separately as lyrics, which you did in, in part. And big, mushy, you know, diagrams and a little bit and documentary and all sorts of um, collaged poetry elements. Um, Alain is much more consistent. And, um, Nali made a very interesting choice of control around a poem that is filled with the, basically a use of dreams, almost predictive dreams about political uh, crisis, the crisis in, her, in that case of um, the, urban, the breakdown of, of the urban in uh, New York, a kind of allegorized New York of the, I think it was 1970s or 1980s. So I think, you know, it, the question that you really raise is, how do individual small units of poeticity, like the line, or like a, like a stanza break, actually, how can you discuss that in the, in the breadth of the long poem? And um, that, is, that is the question. I mean, that, you know, that, that would be a very specific, site-specific choice to try to figure out in a number of long poems that you admire or respect or are interested in, and then try to generalize from it. I think that we don't really understand how to read um, poeticity in the long poem. It's a very hard road to hook um, because the scale of one and the, the minuteness of the other are uh, very difficult to keep in balance uh, intellectually and in emotionally, in feeling, feelingly when you're responding to the poem. Hi. Uh, we have one, this one more question, I think, is because Judy just indicated this to me. Okay, so you're, yes, please. Okay. No, your question is on, but I'm sorry about it. Anybody else who wanted to pop up? Uh, I'm uh, intrigued by the idea of another life uh, or a second life, and I, uh, it's sort of a simple question, but how much is the concept of the unconscious kind of crucial to all of this? I, I was thinking of analysis, terminal and terminal, or, or a, a kind of a structure um, um, that's political, that shared but is, is highly singular, that doesn't have a no in it, or that, you know, in the, in the reclaim of the unconscious doesn't even have time in it. So I, I just, I felt like that's maybe where the, that would be where the big or, or where all of this archiving, which is so wonderful and very sort of where we're going. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, my answer is going to be less satisfying than the question, because I think sure. the, um, the, the, any one of the methods that we've learned to analyze society and the self in modernity, Freud among them, but others like Marx or like um, uh, Benjamin or, some, or Adorno, okay, is a method or an intellectual system that can be uh, chosen. It isn't something that necessarily smooshes over all the poets, um, unless you want to refer to an interpretation of every poet. I think it's a choice that poets make to rather be influenced by Freud, to find Freud appropriate um, in a larger way to conceptualize what it is they're doing. And of that, there are two people um, who definitely do. One is H.D., who is very, um, very appropriately um, using Freud to try to understand history of being the change the changeability of consciousness in relationship to war and trying to remake that war by changes of consciousness that she's somehow instantiating by means of Helen, changing Helen, changing Achilles, and so on. That's one person who actually uses Freud assiduously and 
you know, elegantly and with map with uh, an understanding. The other person is Beverly Dahlin, actually, a reading, which is a very important uh, work. Um, not as I probably was up on the list of, for for length. It's not as long at this point in in publication as some of the long poems. But she definitely uses a Freudian method of free association, which she writes in sort of prose blocks. Um, to to connect to connect her materials, and it's very well worth looking at this poem to understand how the, the use of Freud by the poet. Your question, of course, is very different, right? And I'm not going to answer that question because it really involves um, acceding to, you know, trying to understand in what way a subjectivity in poetry does this work or that work or the other work. No, I. You know, it is kind of, um, I think it's a little bit beyond summarizing. Okay. okay. I mean, I'm sure my, the unconscious is in play, you know. <laughs> what can I say? Um, so, are we going to go have a drink?